500 donkeys, and very many servants, so that this man was the greatest of all the people of the East. His sons used to go and hold feasts in one another's houses in turn, and they would send and invite their three sisters to eat and drink with them. And when the feast days had run their course, Job would send and sanctify them, and he would rise early in the morning and offer burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, It may be that my children have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. This is what Job always did. One day the heavenly beings came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. The Lord said to Satan, Where have you come from? Satan answered the Lord, From going to and fro on the earth and from walking up and down on it. The Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? There is no one like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man who fears God and turns away from evil. Then Satan answered the Lord, Does Job fear God for nothing? Have you not put a fence around him and his house and all that he has on every side? You have blessed the work of his hands and his possessions have increased in the land. But stretch out your hand now and touch all that he has, and he will curse you to your face. The Lord said to Satan, Very well, all that he has is in your power. Only do not stretch out your hand against him. So Satan went down out from the presence of the Lord. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. Good morning, church. So great to see all of you here this morning as we continue our journey through the scripture. So it has just been wonderful uh, getting to see this overarching narrative of the Bible. And if you remember last week, we were looking at the wisdom books, the books of Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Job. And last week, we only had time to get to the first two, Proverbs and Ecclesiastes. And then today, we're going to talk about Job. And then lastly, I want to talk about how the three books kind of work together to help shape and guide our lives, okay? So I want to do a quick recap, though, for those of you who might not have been here last week, or sometimes uh, it's hard to remember things from one week to the next. So uh, in the book of Proverbs, we learned that God organized the world through his wisdom, that in the creation, God actually wove his wisdom into the creation of what we see. And the book of Proverbs teaches us that those who find God's wisdom will be blessed, and those who are unable to find, or even worse, reject God's wisdom, will be cursed. The book of Proverbs is very cause and effect. If a man does not work, he does not eat. A person will reap what they sow. That's kind of the idea of the book of Proverbs, that if we pursue wisdom, we find blessing, and if we pursue folly, we find curses. And then we got to the book of Ecclesiastes, and it basically says, you know, that's good. Wisdom is good. You should pursue wisdom if you can. But wisdom is no guarantee of success. In fact, sometimes somebody can be very wise and bad things can happen to them. And somebody can be a gigantic fool and somehow things just work out just fine. And the central theme in Ecclesiastes was this idea that life is beyond your control. That one day you will die whether you are wise or foolish. And the, everything that around you is really outside of your control. So Ecclesiastes would say, be wise, but realize that you can't control your life. So stop trying and trust God and live a righteous life. That's kind of the idea behind Ecclesiastes. And then we get to this story of Job. And when you get to Job, the wheels kind of fall off of the train, so to speak. In the book of Job, we see this guy that's wise. He's living according to the book of Proverbs. He's living a life. He's not trying to, to do anything evil. He's upright and holy before God. And in fact, you can see that he takes great lengths to do this. He wakes up early in the morning and he says, you know what, maybe one of my kids forgot to make a sacrifice today. I know, I'll do it for him. And so he tried to live this holy and righteous life. 
And if you've just got done reading the book of Proverbs, you'd think, well, no wonder it's going well for him. He's a holy and just man. But then all of a sudden, we get to this scene where God is up in heaven with this figure called the Satan. And I want to be very clear, up to this point in the Bible, we don't have this idea of the devil yet like we have with the devil and Jesus in the wilderness. That thought process hasn't been developed up to this point in the story. So to the original readers of Job, the Satan would have been seen much like a prosecuting attorney. His job was to go to and fro throughout the earth and accuse people of their wrongs. That's kind of the general idea of it. And so the Satan goes up and he's meeting with God and God says, Hey, Satan, have you considered my servant Job? You know, there's nobody else in all of the earth that's like him. He's more righteous than anybody else that I know. And Satan goes, well, of course he is, because you've given him everything. You've put a fence around his house. He'd be an idiot not to serve you, because he gets up early and sacrifices for his kids, and he does all of this stuff. You've given him all this cattle, and you've given him all of this other, these other things. Of course he's going to serve you, but if you take, take those things away, he'll curse you to your face. And that's a key I'm going to come back to in a second. But to bring this kind of up into the American culture, what what the Satan would basically be saying today is, of course they serve you. It's the prosperity gospel. They're going to serve you as long as they think that they can get something out of it. I call it the blab it and grab it philosophy. You go to some churches and they say, you just speak it into being and you pray for it long enough and God will give it to you. It's all about material possessions. It's all about God blessing us with wealth. And you've probably heard some of these sermons before if you've been in the church long enough. I stumbled into a church one time when I was in Cincinnati. A friend invited me, and they just bought the pastor a new Cadillac. And boy, they had a great service to dedicate the Cadillac, and they were just praying that everybody else would be that blessed. Well, the reason why they had to get the pastor a new Cadillac was because if evidence of God's blessing on you as material possessions, what does it look like when the pastor's driving an old Mazda, beat up Mazda, right? That doesn't look too good on you. (laughs) It had to sit there a while, didn't it? (laughs) But we know that our blessings doesn't come through our material possessions. And so the Satan is saying, of course Job's serving you, You could follow the book of Proverbs just to get the blessings and never love God to begin with. And so he says, as soon as you take the prosperity away, Job will curse you to your face. And so we need to realize that throughout the rest of the book, that's the Satan's job. That's his goal, is to get Job to curse God to his face. That's kind of the end game. And so God agrees to allow the Satan to come after Job and All of Job's livestock dies. And so one servant after another, you know how you have those days where everything just seems to be going wrong? Well, that's what happened. The first servant ran in and is like, hey, all your livestock's dead. The next one ran in, hey, your kids are dead. And it was just one after another, after another, after another. And then when you didn't think it could get any worse, Job came down with a serious illness, boils, and just became really ill. Now remember, Job doesn't deserve any of this. God himself said so. And yet here we are, Job's world falling apart in spite of him doing everything the right way. And at first, Job is able to praise God even in the midst of the destruction. He says, you know, basically the good Lord gives and the good Lord takes away. We've heard that before, right? And and he's able to bless God even in the midst of all of the struggle and the tragedy. And I think sometimes we can do that as Christians. At first, something bad happens and we're able to go, you know what, I can still praise you in this storm. But when the storm lasts for days and days and days, our own strength starts to run out. And Job, just like us, begins to doubt. And he begins to question God. And so things are going really bad for Job. And a few of his friends catch wind that uh, Job's not having a good day. And so they figure, you know, we better go take him some Bob Evans and see if we can get him back up to health. 
And so they prepare a little potluck, and they, t- they go over, and they sit down with Job. And these, these guys, they had read the book of Proverbs. It's very clear. They understood this ideology. And they said, Job, God promised you that if you did the right things, you'd be blessed. And if you did the right things, you'd be cursed. And clearly, you were more cursed than anybody else. So what did you do wrong? And Job said, I didn't do anything wrong. I have no idea what I, what I could have done. And so much of the book of Job was actually these poetic arguments between Job and his friends. And his friends would say, hey, Job, did you consider this? Maybe you did this wrong. And then Job says, no, I didn't do that. And then they go, well, Job, did you think about this? Maybe you did this wrong. And Job goes, no, I didn't do that. And it bounces back and forth for quite a bit of the book. And so in the midst of this dialogue, we see Job going from these periods of great trust in God. There's moments in the book of Job where Job says, I trust God, and I know God's going to get me through this, and I'm keeping my face on God. And then there's other moments in the book of Job where Job is crying out to God, where are you? I can't see you. Are you still going to be faithful to me? And any of us that have walked the road with Christ know this, right? We get into these seasons that can be so hard, that can be so trying. The darkness can be so deep. And there's moments when we can go, I know that God is going to get me through. I know that God is faithful to me. I'm trusting in God and his word. And then 15 minutes later, we could be going, God, where are you? Don't you still love me? Aren't you still there? Do you even hear my cry? Did you not hear me 15 minutes ago say that I trusted you? It's the attitude that we have when our faith is being tested. But there's something critical to realize here in all of it whether it be the greatest joy or the greatest amount of struggle and questioning, Job never took his eyes off of God. His questions were always directed to God. His praise was always directed to God. It was still in the midst. You know, God has broad shoulders. It doesn't bother him in the least when we say, where are you? What are you doing? Show me your plan in this because I don't understand. He knows that. He knows the hairs on your head. And so Job is going from these periods of great trust to these periods of great doubt. And it seems like right before Job's about ready to snap, God intervenes. By the end of this dialogue, Job starts to accuse God of being unfair. And if you're looking at this from a human wisdom, if you're looking at this from a human point of view, could you really blame him? It does seem a little unfair. Job's doing nothing wrong. In fact, Job's doing everything that God asked him to do. And then God basically points to the Satan and says, hey, you want to destroy his life? Doesn't seem fair, does it? But yet that's what this book is about. It's about not relying on our human wisdom. And so Job demands that God comes and explain himself. Job demands that God would come down and say, why is all of this unjust stuff happening to me? And God listens. He comes in the form of a great storm. And I want you to listen to what he says to Job in the 38th chapter of the book. He says, who is this that darkens counsel by my words without knowledge? Gird up your loins like a man, and I will question you, and you shall declare to me. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know. And God continues in this line of questioning. Where were you when I threw the stars into the sky? Where were you when I made the fish in the sea? He asked him all of these questions. Where were you when I was displaying this majestic power? Because throughout the book, Job was asking God the very same question. Where are you? And as soon as Job started to cross the line and saying God was unjust, God said, wait a minute. Where were you at? 
when I literally set this whole thing in motion, when I created you. And then he goes on and he says, Job, you don't understand anything that's happening here. All you really understand is you're one small piece of the puzzle, minuscule as it is. Your viewpoint is so limited, you can't know all that's at play. And then God takes Job on a tour of the universe. He shows Job the inner workings of the cosmos. He shows him how all of creation is woven together. And he goes, here you go, Job. You want the keys to the kingdom? You think you could run this for even a moment of time? God tells Job, that he is able to intimately understand the workings of creation in a way that Job never could. And this humbles Job. And listen to what he says. Then Job answered the Lord, I know that you can do all things and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. Who is this that hides counsel without knowledge? Therefore I have uttered what I did not understand. Things too wonderful for me, which I did not know. Hear, and I will speak. I will question you, and you declare to me. I had heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees you. Therefore I despise myself, and repent in dust and ashes. Job never learns why he had to suffer. He didn't know why he was feeling the pain that he was feeling in that moment. But Job said something profound. He said, you know, up to this point, God, I've only heard about you. I heard about you in my Sunday school class. I heard about you because the pastor preaches every week. I heard about you. I believed in you. He said, but now I see you. In church, there's a difference you can sit in here every week and never see God. You can hear about him. You can think about him. You can even pray to him. But you may not ever see him. And sometimes it's those great struggles in our lives that help us to see the very face of God. And so even in the midst of the pain, Job didn't know that anything was going to be fixed at this point in the story. He said, God, I may be dying. You may have taken everything from me, but you are God and I am not. And that's the key to wisdom. The key to wisdom is recognizing that we are human beings, limited in scope and limited in knowledge but that we serve the creation, creator of the universe that weaves all things together. But fortunately for Job, this isn't where the book ends. God comes and he restores Job's health, and he gives Job twice as much as he lost. He doubled the blessing. Now, I've often heard people take this way out of context. I came up in a charismatic background, and the teaching went something like this. God cursed Job so that he could give him twice as much stuff. That's missing the entire point of the book. When we look at the book like that, we're actually being fools. And the reason why people think that way is because as Americans, we're consumeristic and we love our stuff. So of course we're going to make it about the stuff. But that's not what this story is about. This story is trying to show us the importance of true wisdom. It was only because of Job's wisdom that he was able to see God face to face. If he was a fool, he would have cursed God, just like his wife told him to. Why don't you curse God and die, his wife told him earlier in the book, and he would have listened. But he wasn't. He showed wisdom. And he was able to see God. And listen to how the book closes. It says, After this, Job lived 140 years and saw his children and his children's children, four generations. And Job died old and full of days. And the Hebrew word there for full 
literally means totally satisfied. Job lived and died totally satisfied. There was a difference in Job. If you read Job at the beginning, he's a little neurotic. I better get up really early and make sure I make enough sacrifices so God will be happy with me and bless me. Is that not kind of the attitude of the church? Oh, I just got to do enough that God will be happy with me and bless me. But that's not wisdom. Job, through seeing God face to face, recognized what wisdom is. It's realizing that God is God and he is not. And that he can trust God to take care of all of that, that he doesn't need to micromanage everything. And so we see in the book of Job a summary of all of the wisdom literature, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and, of course, Job. Job realizes what life is all about. He stops trying to control his life and trust God. And he dies full of days. He dies totally satisfied. And I have to wonder, if I did a poll of the people in this room and I said, are you totally satisfied with your life? Are you absolutely 100% totally satisfied? I'd have to guess, I'll be honest with you, in my own heart, Say no. No. We went out in this community and across America and said, are you totally satisfied with your life? No. And yet, we spend so much time chasing things that will never bring us satisfaction. The book of Job shows us how to navigate life when things come totally off the rails. That in the deep trials, we can remember that the God who gave birth to this world will also be with us and sustains us. And each one of these books, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Job, they each have value on their own. But I think they're most powerful when you look at all three of them together. And so what I want to do just briefly is I want to look at these three books as a whole and how I really believe they tie into our culture today. And you know, we live in a time, and we live in a culture that tells us that we're really not made for anything. They would tell you that you are nothing but a cosmic accident. That somehow through some big bang, a little bit of bacteria was made, which grew into something, which grew into something, and then a monkey, and then a person or something. I'm not all that up on it but that somehow we were basically put into a big garbage can, shooken up, thrown out, and here we have it. And because of that, our, my, our, our lives really don't mean anything. Our lives are simply a result of evolution. And because of that, our lives and the way that we structure our lives are nothing but a matter of our own personal opinions and what's best for us. Because there's really no way to define good and evil. There's really no source of life that tells us how we should structure things. Now listen to me, I'm not saying that science isn't important. I think it is. In fact, I love science. It blesses our lives in so many ways. So don't hear me saying that we shouldn't embrace science as Christians. What I'm saying, though, is that science cannot make us wise. Science is very good at telling us how things happen, but it's not very good at telling us the meaning behind it. So let me give you an example of this. I go to the doctor, and I find out that I have stage 4 cancer. The doctor can use science to tell me what the cancer is. The doctor can use science to try to treat the cancer. The doctor can tell me all of the medical evidence about the cancer that I have, but the doctor can't tell me how to find life in the midst of the cancer. The doctor can't tell me how to find meaning in the midst of the cancer. The doctor can't help my family find hope in the midst of watching me suffer with cancer. 
You see, they have all of the scientific knowledge, but they lack what really matters. Wisdom. We live in a world that wants to trust humanity and its inventions more than the God who created us in his image. We live in a society that says, really, we have no divine purpose at all. And is it any wonder that we are becoming more and more of a society that's dependent on alcohol, that's dependent on drugs, that's dependent on technology, that's dependent on shopping and getting the next material thing, that's dependent on doing anything to cover up the fact that we really feel like we have no meaning? That when most Americans get to the end of their life and they are laying on their deathbed, they can't honestly say, I've been totally satisfied. Because we're always conditioned to want more. One more day, one more thing, one more this, one more that. When wisdom would tell us, stop trying to control everything and realize that you were created for something. That God has placed a dream and a vision in your heart. That you weren't an accident, but that you were created and woven together by the God of all eternity and were put here for a reason. Science and human philosophy cannot tell you how to handle life when all that you have is destroyed but wisdom can. Church, there are some wounds that only God can heal. Sure, you can take a pill to tamp down the depression. Sure, you can go see a counselor and work through all of the issues in your life, and I would encourage you to do those things. Those are good things. Thank God that we have things to help people along in their journey but it doesn't get to the root of the issue. There are some things that only God can heal. There are some fractures in our life that only God can repair. And only the wise will see that. Church, we are called to be a people of wisdom. And through our lives, Transform the community and the world by living into God's purpose. So let us strive to spend each day seeking God's wisdom and coming together to be that city on a hill where people can come when their lives are falling apart and find a hope that they'll never find anywhere else. Will you pray with me? Gracious God, we thank you this morning for your wisdom that leads us and sustains us. Stir in us, stir in us a new passion for the lost and the broken amongst us. Stir in us a new passion to truly pursue wisdom in our lives and the purpose that you would have for us. Help us, Lord, to lay down the things that so easily entangle us. And instead, Lord, seek you first. Seek your purpose first. As we're transformed more and more into your likeness. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took a loaf of bread and he blessed it and he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples, and he said, Take and eat. This is my body broken for you. And in the same way, he took the cup. He blessed it, and he gave it to his disciples, and he said, Take and drink. This is the blood of my new covenant, shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Jesus suffered just like Job suffered. He was no stranger to suffering. 
And yet he laid down his life for us so that together we may live life to the full, so that we can be satisfied. And I'd like to encourage you this morning, church, as you reach out and receive the bread of Christ, as you take that in your hand, at the same time in your spirit, lay down those things that don't truly fill you up, so that your heart is fully ready to receive the bread that can fill you and nourish you beyond your wildest dreams. If we could have our ushers come forward, please. Let us pray. Gracious God, we confess that at times we do not live into your call to wisdom. At times, we can try to control our lives, and we can try to control the circumstances around us. But Lord, we acknowledge that you are God and we are not, and we repent of those places today. Father, we pray that you would take these elements of bread and cup and make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, so that we may be the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. Fill us with the certain hope of your salvation. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Church, this is the body of Christ, broken for you. And this is his blood poured out for you. In the United Methodist Church, we have an open communion table. If you have a love of Jesus in your heart, you are welcome to come and feast at this heavenly banquet. Uh, There will be gluten-free elements that I'll be serving um, at the table to my left, if you have that need. Um, And uh, we'll be taking communion by intinction. So you will be handed a piece of bread and dip it into the juice. Let all who are willing to come, come and feast at this heavenly banquet.